Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Craig Norman. We're going to be speaking about how lawsuits shaped myopia management on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We are here with Craig Norman. Uh, he is back uh, with us to talk with us a little bit about the state of the industry and where we're going in the future with certain products and certain, uh, certain things. Uh, Craig, it's an honor to have you again on the Myopia Podcast. Thank you, Dave. And, uh, you know, congratulations on what appears to be a great initiative you're doing in this arena. Thank you very much. Well, um, you know, several months ago here, we had uh, the release of Johnson & Johnson's new product onto the market, becoming seemingly the second uh, FDA-approved product uh, in the myopia management, at least is what it's being called, space as well as my site space. All the other products that are out there are definitely FDA approved. I want to make that clear for the correction of myopia. It's just how some of us are using it off label for the myopia management side. So Craig, my, my first question for you is, how do you see this initiative with uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, and Cooper Vision kind of kickstarting this whole, uh, whole, whole crusade around myopia management? Yeah, I, I think there's nothing but upside here. That if we look back over the last 15 or 20 years of, in particular, ortho K, what you would routinely hear as a complaint from eye care practitioners is that the message was not getting to the patients and that they were having to build the message themselves, uh, you know, patient by patient rather than it be driven by some major initiative. And, you know, both Cooper Vision and Johnson & Johnson have um, banded together with some of the major um, organizations like the AOA, for instance, in, in, in optometry that help to deliver those messages. And, and I just think that to try to build this at this point, it's going to have to be somewhat on the shoulders of those bigger companies. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we know, uh, we know Bausch & Lomb is entering into this space as well. They've got several different initiatives put forth. And uh, so that'll be great to see, uh, you know, a third major company. And we know that Alcon has supported Myopia Management with their, uh, with, with their funding and will be anxious to see where they go with future products. Um, mm -hmm. Where do you where do you see the uh, the the other maybe if I may I don't mean to downplay them peripheral companies right I just stated the four four big ones but right. who else is in this space kind of really leading this myopia management effort Yeah, so I think first of all one of one of the fascinating things that we're we're at this tipping point right now for the companies that are in uh, the myopia space is they, each company is going to need to decide, are they an, an ortho K company? Or are they a spectacle lens company? Are they an atropine company? Or are they a myopia management company? And if they are a myopia management company, it means that they're going to have to have all of those offers, uh, including spectacle lenses. So uh, I, I think that, that we're at that tipping point. For the companies, you know, and there's some major ones here in, in the U.S. and, and globally, uh, you know, probably led by uh, the CRT folks. But, of course, they're part of Cooper. And you have the yep. Euclid, initiative that, uh, Euclid initiative that's happening, uh, along with numerous other uh, ortho K uh, companies. Uh, they're going to all have to figure out exactly where they're going to fit in here. You know, for instance, yeah. Dave, I don't know if you're aware, but at last count, there's around 18 or 19 VST lens designs. Right. Yeah. And so, so you take VST lens designs. That doesn't include Euclid. Euclid now, you know, with their own separate approvals is outside the VST approval. And then underneath the Paragon approval, there's another half a dozen lens designs. 
There's 25 yeah. orthokatocytes in the yeah, U.S. And yeah. the question is, do we need that many? I mean, I can't answer that. But more importantly, will each of those companies be able to provide the practitioner with everything they need, all the tools they need mm -hmm. uh, to actually take those products and make them work for patients? So I'm just going to bring some uh, some some clarity, and then you can you can actually tell me where I'm wrong. But when Paragon got their uh, their lens approved by the FDA, it was with yeah. their material. But there were all these other companies that were doing orthokeratology, and they were not approved, so to speak. And so Bausch and Lomb came up with this VST design uh, VST system, whereby utilizing their material. Uh, there was a process for all of these different companies under the VST system with Bausch and Lomb that these other designs could be available. So the lens that you may be using from a local laboratory or an orthokeratology company is likely under the VST system being an FDA approved uh, orthokeratology program. Right. Did I restate that? I think that happened in the around 2003 or four, maybe four. five, four? 2004. Yeah. Uh, that, and, and that the Bosch and Loam folks, they did a terrific thing, actually. There was multiple patents that were available at that time. And it, and it appeared like there, before Ortho K could even get off the ground, there would be a lot of time with companies being spent in court fighting over who had the patent rights. And what Bosch and Loam did is they got the major patent holders, three or four of them, the major patent holders, got them together and said, let's not spend a lot of time suing each other here. How about if with the Boston material, we gain this approval and that we charge the, the raw material cost extra by a couple of bucks or whatever it was, and we're going to split that with you patent holders, and you're not you're going to agree not to sue each other over this thing, so we could try to get this <laughs> off the ground. And uh -huh. and it was really a major deal. And and if you remember, that's why at that time there was the red and yellow buttons, because yes. the color was the way that one could count who or, or which raw materials were actually being fabricated into the VST designs. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. I, uh, I wasn't aware that that was the reason for the counting reasons, but uh, how brilliant of them to make sure that our industry didn't end up as a, uh, a, a super litigious uh, yeah. and would have ruined myopia uh, control or orthokeratology at the time. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, Dave, if I could inter interject, we're kind of at that point here today within the Softlands arena as well. Oh, sure we are. We in, are. In, in that... Uh, when Brian Holden was still alive, Brian had the foresight to see that there could be a lot of fighting between the patent holders of extended depth of focus designs. And he gathered all of those folks together, except for one, uh, under the same situation so that when uh, those extended depth of focus uh, soft lenses for myopia management hit the market, that there wouldn't be a lot of lawsuits there as well. Really, um, and so now we are, you know, probably going to be seeing additional lenses that are coming out, and hopefully that's not uh, held up by uh, litigation in any Correct. way. Interesting. Correct. So let's uh, let's let's reference a little bit into the soft lens world. You know, we've mm -hmm. got my sight lens that is uh, obviously FDA approved. It's been. Uh, around the world for a, a very long time. We have some six-year data that was published at the BCLA with regards to soft lenses with, uh, with Cooper's lens. Um, who else are you seeing kind of in that space with regards to soft lenses? And, you know, certainly don't leave out uh, custom manufactured lenses sure. with regards to that. Sure. So, you know, m most of the work that I'm aware of that is is happening, um, besides with the big major soft lens manufacturers here in the U.S., is happening offshore. Uh, there's a company called Seed, S-E-E-D, mm -hmm. out of Japan, uh, who is deep into this, uh, that 
and they are using lenses in different markets in the world in the extended depth of focus arena. Uh, outside of the U.S. also, there's a company named Mark Onavoy. I don't know if you're familiar with that name, Dave, but they're a major specialty soft lens manufacturer uh, out of Spain. Uh, it's either Spain or Portugal, if I, I have that correct. Uh, they, they are going down this path uh, as well. And although I have zero intelligence or insight, I would have to uh, uh, wager a cup of coffee at least that you know, J&J &J, you know, has something on the drawing board and B&L must have something on the drawing board. And then there's the quiet one that is on the sidelines, which is Alcon. Uh, you would have to think that they have some response in this category as well. Yeah, yeah. We also know um, that the the VTI company, uh, the Natriview lens, is has been used by individuals for quite some time yeah. in the myopia management space. Now, obviously, that is outside of the uh, approval of that product. It's approved to be used by children or adults, but for the purposes of myopia management, um, you know, we I, I keep backpedaling this this FDA thing. Let's let's talk a little bit about the importance of that. Um, we we don't want to downplay it, but you know, for years, you and I have been doing things with products that are not FDA approved. Yep. Uh, you know, every time a patient has a corneal ulcer, I prescribe an antibiotic that doesn't have approval for mm -hmm. uh, corneal ulcers, but it has it for bacterial, you know, conjunctivitis. So we step outside of this. How, how worried should we be? Or, you know, everybody has to deal with that on their own, but how, do, how do, should we really be falling with regards to this, this FDA criteria in your yeah. mind? So it's uh, the- oh, Boy, I put you on the, on the loop there. No, no, I? I think it's such, an in, <laughs> it's such an interesting topic, right? Because I agree, there isn't a medical professional, forget just eye care, a medical professional that is not prescribing or recommending off-label use of something for their patients every day, right? And, and without really going into a whole dialogue with the patient about off-label, on-label, I think there's two reasons why in, in this area of myopia, it's a bigger deal. And one is uh, it's because it's kids. And we're talking in terms of many kids between five and eight years old starting off. Uh, and then the other is, in particular, in the area uh, of overnight ortho K, is the overnight component of sleeping in a lens. Although uh, we know clinically and we know also from studies that um, ortho K is a different animal because all day long, every day, it's exposed to the natural environment of being reoxygenated, and it's not like having a chunk of plastic on your eye from 70 to 30 days, it's from six to eight hours, and then a normal life during the rest of that day. I think that that's what scares people more than anything. The other is, if you remember, in the earlier stages of Ortho K, there was a lot of disasters, disaster stories, let me put it that way. Uh, most of that was coming out of Asia, uh, most of it was in situations um, that were very complex, but, but unfortunately, probably the biggest driver of that is that the patients that were being fit with overnight ortho K were using low DK or no DK materials, and they were often not having any follow-up at all until they ended up in an emergency room or in somebody's chair with an inflamed uh, uh, angry eye. So I think that that's the area that is scaring people. Uh, and then there's, you know, we live in the U.S., it's the most litigious society in the world. And, you know, before we're, you know, done here, I'm expecting, you know, I'll have a couple of lawsuits from something that you said to me that I'll have to <laughs> institute. Uh, and my attorney is actually on the other screen here watching over everything. Dude. Of course, of course. Now, Craig, you you grew up in in an ophthalmology space. Mm -hmm. You grew up working in the ophthalmology world. How did orthokeratology fit in? Because uh, and, and and help me see this history. 
and maybe you just stated from the disasters that were there, um, it seems as if the, the practitioners who are working with, uh, within ophthalmology spaces are more comfortable with a soft multifocal yeah. or maybe the use of atropine, whereas those of us in the optometric world are more in the uh, orthokeratology or maybe comfortable using it. There seems to have been this, this period of time where orthokeratology came under really bad wraps in the ophthalmology space, and it seems like we have not resolved that yet. No, no. I can, can tell you from the group that I was involved in, which is a really great group of ophthalmologists, and I came on board in, in the 70s purely to build the specialty contact lens practice, and, and that opened up a lot of leeway in how we were treating patients. But I still remember the, the moment when I got their attention is that I had fit a young kid um, with um, overnight ortho K, had terrific results, and took the maps that showed those terrific results to a management meeting with our ophthalmologist and said, what do, you, what do you think of this? And they looked at it and they said, wow, that looks like a really successful refractive surgery procedure, and I would expect with great results. And I said, well, that it's true, except this was from overnight wear of a contact lens, and they couldn't believe it was actually possible, right? And that, that's mm -hmm. what opened up their eyes to it. There were questions about the safety factor, um, but, you know, that ophthalmologists in general, they don't want to put any patient at huge risk, but they also don't man mind managing the risk as well, uh, and that, you know, they're, they're going out on a limb making decisions every day. And, you know, really, in my mind, what ophthalmologists get paid for is not making just the initial decision, but making the second, third, fourth decision when the, the ones don't work, right? Uh, and yeah. so I think, unfortunately, the major organizations within ophthalmology still are some of that old school thinking uh, to address yeah. your, your question. And very often, anything you see written in, in that area, there's always like this last paragraph that says warning, you know, about overnight ortho K, you know, can cause your, you know, arms to fall off or something. And yeah, and, yeah. Uh, that, that part, I think, is a little bit uh, un unfortunate. Yeah. Well, as with any industry, you know, I, I'm, I don't mean to pigeonhole every ophthalmologist into this space. You know, we've got some real leaders in the field, Vance Thompson being sure. one of them. And, you know, most of us have, who, who, who know ophthalmology know him to be a refractive and cataract specialist, but he's a major advocate for myopia management with our friend Brooke Messner uh, yeah. recently uh, joining his team about a year ago and uh, really doing a great job there. Um, and, and, and others, and I, I don't mean to, to point out all ophthalmology, but I still feel that we've got a little ways to go, and maybe that's with an optometry too, sure. but to get the okay on ortho K okay, uh, as far as it being a safe procedure. Yeah. You know, I even remember back, uh, I think it was uh, Helen, Helen, who, Helen Swarbuck who did uh, an evaluation of the lit for microbial keratitis and orthokeratology. And it was still the vast majority of those cases that were published were sure. in, uh, in Asia. And the commonality amongst most of the ir ir irregular outcomes was because of uh, hand washing. Yeah. So exactly. uh, hopefully, we, hopefully we, we make a, a, a dent in that. How do we inform Optometrist you know, and Dave, to, to, to address that, I think it's interesting, and you know, I always used to think of this in terms of primarily ortho K and ophthalmology, but I think it fits in so many different ways, is that all of us are only as up to date as the last presentation we've attended or the last paper we've written or, or read, excuse me, <laughs> right? Yeah. In, in the world of ophthalmology, very often, that was during their residency. And it was the last piece of information in a hugely quickly evolving field. And mm. it kind of left them a little bit out of date on exactly what was happening in that arena. Yeah. And so yeah. 
to answer your point, we need to get more of that information in front of all the stakeholders uh, within the myopia management field uh, to bring them up to date on where we are at today, not where we were at in the late 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Yeah. You know, you bring something up that's really interesting, and I'm going to make an analogy for my optometry colleagues with regards to what you just said, that uh, I came away from my education understanding, and, and, and this is completely separate from myopia management, but that is that optometry does not prescribe many non-steroidal anti-inflammatory eye drops. Yeah. The reason why is because of the corneal perforations that they cause. Well, if you go back and you look at the, the few studies that actually showed a corneal perforation, it was so low that yeah. we see risks of glaucoma and all those things with steroids far more prevalent. But sure. we all remember this corneal perforation, and, and it just tends to have completely uh, you know, lamb-blasted non-steroidals in the optometric community. And I think that, that, that point that you brought up, that's an analogy that if we heard that in school or in those early days of practice, it is now stuck with us and look at how it's changed our profession. And I think that's to the perspective that you brought yeah. uh, it, it, with regards to orthokeratology. For you know, like for instance, David, so we're, we're deeply involved in, in not, we, I mean, you and I and, and our peers are deeply involved, not just in um, educating people about contact lenses and contact lens therapies. Uh, but we're also deeply involved in trying to keep up to date with all the latest information, you know, whether it be, you know, from something that we see on a weekly basis in contact lens today, you know, which you write for routinely, and there's a blurb, a little snippet of information or reading the throwaway journals or reading, you know, the peer reviewed journals. But if that's not built into the routine of an eye care professional, and the only time they're getting an education is at the annual state meeting, for instance, you can see where it's easy to get left behind on what's yeah. uh, changing rapidly. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm excited for, you know, the educational initiatives that we just discussed with you know, the big four major contact lens companies, uh, Hoya, Essilor, uh, Euclid, the, these bigger companies that are really, you know, leading the charge from an industry perspective and their support at those state and local yeah. and society meetings and how they're already. I mean, this year alone, you know, I think we've had one or two in our local society that's kind of around myopia management of a you know, 12, 12 meetings we have a year. So that's really cool to see that. And I think your point is well taken is this topic becomes a bigger topic uh, for these major companies. I think we're going to start to see it whittle down to our local societies and our right. state meetings. So Dave, does your local society have anything close to a study group part of it? Uh, not really. Nope. Nope, uh, not really. And it, it may be, you know, I, my society is pretty large. Uh, we're trying to make it smaller by dividing it. And that's been something that's happened over the last year and a half, two years. Uh, but, you know, in, in smaller societies, I think that's a little easier to do. But in a really big one, maybe not. Yeah, it would have to be in subgroups of some sort. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Well, uh, last question that I have for you is for you to embark upon what, what you anticipate seeing in the next year to three years in the myopia space, three years from today, as uh, we're talking with clinicians, what's going to be different about how we're doing things in our everyday life? Or, or maybe what do we want to see it different? Right. right. Well, I, I think I'll begin with uh, by saying that spectacles will have a significant role uh, compared to zero role that they have today here in the U.S. Um, the ease of use, the, the ease of understanding for parents, uh, you know, along with kids. Uh, and, you know, that technology, which is pretty fascinating. And if, if the technology actually delivers on its promise, 
and, and what we're expecting, I think it, it's going to have a, a really significant difference. Um, mm-hmm. And I think more than anything, I see that as maybe that first level entry point. I don't think the other yeah. therapies are going to go away, whether it be uh, ortho K or multifocal soft lenses. Yeah, atropine for sure. Uh, I don't see that that other stuff going away, but I, I see that glasses are going to be such an easy thing for uh, prescribers to be providing for their patients that I see that change being made. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I think that's going to really play a big part, and we haven't even seen that tidal wave come through. We're seeing the waves getting bigger, but that tidal wave is about to hit, and uh, it'll be a, a great thing for patients and practitioners, we're going to have to figure out how to all pivot within our practices, but I think it's a big one for us. Right. Absolutely. So, so, so don't you think it's a bit different though, because right now you prescribe eyeglasses for one of your patients. They either go to your office and see the optician or they go down the street and see an optician and you don't really think much about it, right? Uh, that unless the patient comes back and you're, you're not that worried necessarily about how their frame is fitting or functioning, you know, you're worried about the refraction and the prescription and how they're adapting to it. Yeah, what's going to happen though, when you're prescribing some really complex type of um, defocus spectacle lens and that prescription is taken outside of your office and filled by an optician anywhere, what is the sense uh, you'll have that it's been done correctly? If, so, if somebody goes to the local retail optician now, do you have them come back to your office so you can check the prescription? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I get you the point that you're, you're making. And uh, I think that that's where myopia management is still going to be a part of this whole process is that if you, if I'm going to write you a prescription for this particular product, which is a, a product designed for myopia management, there's, there's more on the, on the service side that needs to be done in order for us to do it correctly. I don't know that this is going to be the way it is with all offices, but sure. it'll be with mine, is this product is going to be more expensive whether you get it somewhere else or you get it from me. And so thus, if I'm writing that prescription, I'm going to have to sell you on the fact that we need to monitor it and follow it yeah. a little bit closer. Yeah. Now, Craig, I I may see this a little bit different in the fact that my wife does binocular vision and pediatrics. And so when she prescribes a pair of glasses to an amblyope, uh, she knows that in three months she's going to change that prescription. So she, you know, brings the patient back and, you know, we work it out with our laboratory of uh, how much more we're paying them and, you know, the patient, how much they're paying them. And with these uh, myopia management uh, glasses, you know, it's the sort of thing where we're going to see the patients back and we're going to make sure that it's doing the job that it's supposed to do. Whereas uh, really we should be doing that with spectacle lenses and all of our myopic children anyway. We know that if a child is under-prescribed, that they are going to advance. And so if somebody's quickly advancing by a diopter or more every year, it would behoove us to see that child back for a six-month check. Right. And if their prescriptions changed, then we should update their spectacle prescription so that yeah. we're not inducing more myopia by them being undercorrected. Right. So uh, what we should be doing in the future is something we probably should be doing now. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey, uh, I sure appreciate you joining me, Craig. Um, thank you so much for your, uh, your participation in the myopia podcast. It's, it's super appreciated. Thank you, Dave. The pleasure is really all mine. Yes. And, uh, and thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the myopia podcast. Uh, make sure to subscribe so you can stay up to date on future episodes And please leave us a uh, five-star review so we make sure that uh, we know what we're doing well. We'll talk to you later and uh, see you on the next episode. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.